Good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's webinar hosted by Antec Controls by Price titled Healthcare Solutions. Today's live webinar is accredited for one professional development hour. After today's event, everybody who has attended the live webinar session will receive an email link with a link to request the PDH credit. You can submit questions anytime during today's presentation using the chat or question function on your toolbar. We'll get to as many of the questions as we can right at the end of the presentation. To those questions we won't be able to answer at the end, we will reach out to you personally after today's webinar. There are no costs or cancellation fees associated with attending this webinar. My name is David Enns. I'm a professional engineer based in Winnipeg, Manitoba with Antec Controls. I'm the business development specialist here for Antec, uh, and I've been with Price Industries for about six or seven years now. What I'd like to speak with you today about are healthcare solutions. This course is going to introduce you to three critical spaces in the healthcare environment. These are isolation rooms, operating rooms, and compounding pharmacies. And we're going to go through each one of these. For each type of room, we're going to talk about what ASHRAE 170 says we have for requirements, and then we're going to talk about common challenges and some common design considerations you'll need to think about and consider while designing these types of spaces. Coming out of today's webinar, you should be able to identify room pressurization minimums and maximums for each application you should be able to select the correct or most appropriate air valve technology for each application. You should be able to identify common issues within these critical spaces, and you should be able to provide simple solutions for those common issues. And you should be able to select and apply monitors and remote stations in these critical spaces. So what are we going to look at today? We're gonna to spend some time looking at each individual application. We'll start with the most simple, which is the isolation room. And each section will look fairly similar. We'll look at room types, really describing the room and what the intent of these spaces is. We'll look at what the standards require from us for minimums and maximums, things like that. Then we're going to talk about the challenges presented. And then just after that, we're going to try to answer some of those challenges and considerations. We'll do that for isolation rooms, then do it for operating rooms, We'll follow that up with compounding pharmacies, and then we're just going to make some recommendations for the healthcare environment, for air valve technologies, for speeds of control and response, for dealing with pressure cascades, and for dealing with maintenance in these units. We're going to try to address each of these issues as a whole. So let's start with isolation rooms. Again, as I mentioned, this is likely the simplest application we have to work in, is the, is the regular isolation room. You'll see these in a lot of different places. Most hospitals will have a subset of isolation rooms in them. Some will be positive, some will be negative. And they're meant to deal with different types of diseases and different types of patients. Isolation rooms are broken down into three types of space. Airborne infectious isolation, known as AII, protective environments, known as PE rooms, and then the combination of the two, airborne infectious isolation with protective environments. Let's go through each of these individually before we go any farther. Let's start with the AII room. In an airborne infectious isolation room, we are going to house and treat patients who have communicable diseases. So for an airborne infectious isolation room, think about a tuberculosis, smallpox, influenza or measles patient, somebody with a communicable disease. They come into the hospital, they need to be treated, but we can't put the rest of the hospital at large at risk. We need to isolate that space. We need to isolate that airflow from the rest of the hospital to ensure the person next door doesn't get tuberculosis, smallpox, influenza, or measles, for example. So in an airborne infectious isolation room, we will negatively pressurize this space. So the image you see up in front of you, air will constantly flow into that room from the rest of the building. As with most pressurized spaces, a large proportion of that air is going to flow in and around the doorway. That will be the main threshold for that offset air to pass through. 
The next type of room is the protective environment, the PE room. This is essentially the opposite of the AII room. In a protective environment, the person who's come in to be treated in the hospital has a compromised immune system. They are immunocompromised, we call it. These patients just can't deal with all the infections and diseases and, and things in the air that you will find in a typical hospital. Their body just can't fight those as well as it should be able to. So we need to protect this person. We need to protect this environment. And we do that by positively pressurizing these spaces. We constantly blast air out of these rooms to ensure no air infiltrates into the space. So where an airborne infectious isolation room is negative, a protective environment is positive. In the same way, you'll see a large proportion of that offset air flowing out around and underneath the doorway. The third type of room, as I mentioned, is the combination of the first two types. It's airborne infectious isolation with a protective environment. Essentially, this is the same as an AII room, however, it has a positive anti-room connected to it. Meaning, the, buff uh, the actual patient space where you can see the bed is negatively pressurized. We constantly pull air into that space to ensure nothing else from the hospital has access to it. But in doing that, we also add in an anti-space that is positively pressurized. This acts as a barrier between the corridor or the rest of the hospital and the airborne infectious isolation room, mostly ensuring that the only air that infiltrates into the AII room comes from the anti-room. So it's clean, fresh, filtered air. It's understood air that we allow to flow into that protective room. So this would be the combination, the AII with PE type of space. For all three space types, we look at the same standard. We look at ASHRAE 170, and it has very, very similar requirements for each room, aside from the direction of pressure control. So for all of these spaces, according to ASHRAE 170, we need plus or minus 0.01 inches of water. Again, for negative spaces, that will be negative 0.01 inch. For positive spaces like the protective environment, that's positive 0.01 inch. The CSA standards require 0.03. It's actually a higher pressurization level required in Canada. Isolation rooms like these are some of the only ones that are mandated to have pressure monitors. There is a statement in ASHRAE 170 that claims rooms shall have a permanently installed device to constantly monitor the differential pressure. So one thing you will commonly see in a hospital or anywhere with an isolation room is that there will be a pressure monitor of some kind on the wall beside these rooms. We also need to provide a local visual means to indicate when that negative pressure or positive pressure is not being maintained. We need to alarm, we need to visually typically and audibly alarm when these pressures aren't being maintained. Most of these spaces also have provisions to go into a setback or unused mode. So airborne infectious isolation rooms, for example, can have provisions for normal patient care when you don't need the isolation. Meaning we don't want to have a nice dedicated room in the hospital that's not used most of the time. That's wasted space, that's wasted revenue. So we need to have provisions to turn this room into a regularly operating patient room. However, a room that is created as a negative space, such as an airborne infectious isolation room or a protective environment that's created as a positive space, once they are pressurized and designated as pressurized spaces, they cannot flip directions, nor can they go neutral. Meaning, once you set up a negative space, even if you use it for regular patient control, it must always be negative. Positive rooms must always be positive. We still have to do that in those setback modes. We see this uh, less commonly now, but it used to be a more common request to flip rooms between positive and negative. According to the ASHRAE standards, that is not permissible in these spaces. Anti-rooms are really only required for that combination type of space, where you have an immunocompromised patient that also has an airborne infectious disease, somebody who has both of those issues. So on your regular AII and your regular PE rooms, 
we don't really need to see an anteroom. Sometimes they're nice to have, they can create a bit of stability, they can create um, a nice working space in the hospital, but they're not always required. For all of these spaces, the actual proper patient space requires 12 air changes per hour. The anteroom is only required to have 10 air changes per hour. Those can be reduced, like we mentioned before, in unoccupied modes. But remember, just to reiterate, we do still need to maintain that negative or positive isolation even in unoccupied modes. So that's a little bit about the isolation room. That's really the rooms we're dealing with here. That's, that's the challenge presented. So what are some common issues and what are some common design considerations that we should keep front of mind while working in these spaces? First thing is isolation rooms are in constant use. Meaning, even when they don't have um, an immunocompromised patient, patient in them, they're likely being used as a patient space. When we have somebody, say, in a protective environment or AII room, they will be there typically for several days or weeks. They will live in this space. That's something we'll have to consider. We also have to consider that we may want to turn these down to a lower air change rate to conserve energy. We also must monitor pressure at all times. For some of the other applications we're going to look at today, you don't technically need to monitor pressure at all times. The last thing we're going to talk about before we start addressing these issues is that these are extremely stable environments. You might call these fairly quiet rooms. In and out occupant traffic is quite low. The doors are typically closed and the patient most of the time is going to be alone in these spaces. So how do we deal with some of these design considerations? First things first is air valve technology. We would recommend a high accuracy terminal in the isolation room. So when we talk about high accuracy terminals, you can see an example in the top right hand of your screen. These are airflow measuring devices. These are not the mechanically pressure independent spring and cone style Venturi valve but these are more accurate than a VAV box. They kind of live in, in between those two worlds. So these are airflow measuring devices. We recommend these first and foremost because they're a little bit lower pressure drop than a Venturi valve. They do consume, consume less energy than a Venturi valve, making them a little more applicable to the healthcare environment. They're also very good at this stable kind of control we need for these spaces. Again, not a lot changes in an isolation room. Once a patient is housed in this room, they're there for several days, will be at 12 air changes per hour and 70 degrees, for example. Not a lot will change for that patient in that space in that time. With slow actuation and stable control, a high accuracy terminal performs very, very well in this environment. The last thing to mention with a high accuracy terminal is they're a little bit more quiet than a Venturi valve. Again, in an isolation room, people might live several days or weeks in these spaces. Noise will be more of a concern in this application than a typical patient room that people are going to be um, in and out of a little bit quicker. So we will want to keep these rooms a little bit quieter. We will need to consider noise in these spaces. And again, the high accuracy terminal is a bit quieter than the Venturi valve. The next thing we would recommend is that you install room pressure monitors across each doorway. Again, this is a requirement, not so much a recommendation. You need to do this in an isolation room. We will present some um, options you'll have later in the presentation, closer to the end, for how to install and monitor these devices. How many displays you use, how many sensors you use. We're going to come back to that near the end of the presentation. For an isolation space, this is really one of the only rooms I recommend both control strategies for. We state here that volumetric offset or room pressure control are acceptable solutions. So to describe these two a little bit, both volumetric offset, sometimes called offset control, and room pressure control, both of them achieve the same goal. They both pressurize a room using a difference between the supplier and the exhaust air. The difference between the two, however, is the controlled variable. In offset control, or volumetric offset, the controlled variable is flow. 
meaning if you have 1,000 CFM of supply coming in and 1,100 CFM of exhaust or return coming out of the room, you'll constantly maintain that 100 CFM differential, regardless of what else happens in the space, regardless of changing leakage rates, regardless of air change rate, regardless of doors being open and closed. It's a very, very stable, easy to set up way to control a room. Room pressure control is extremely similar, but that controlled variable is a little bit different. In room pressure control, rather than controlling the CFM difference between supply and exhaust, we're going to just control to the room pressure, meaning regardless of what offset is required, it could be 100 CFM, it could be 50, it could be 70 CFM. That number doesn't matter to room pressure control. It will achieve that 0.01 inches you gave it as a target, however, for room pressure control. Because isolation rooms are so stable, because of the low in and out occupant traffic, due to all of those things, either strategy works very, very well. I wouldn't recommend you go either way. I wouldn't say in this case that one is better than the other. They're both very effective ways to control room pressure in this space. We will make a different recommendation for the other room types when we get there. But in the isolation space, you can explore both options and they're both perfectly acceptable. The last thing we'd like to touch on for the isolation room are remote stations. Often isolation rooms will be grouped together. You'll have two or four isolation rooms down the hall grouped together on a single floor and you might have several sets of those on each floor. You'll have a set of nursing staff that is responsible for working in those spaces and monitoring those spaces often with remote desks, often not right in that space there. They will still need to monitor these rooms. They'll, number one, they'll have to monitor their patients. That's the most important thing they do day to day. But they'll also have to monitor room pressure and they might have to move these rooms to setback mode or to isolation mode, depending on patient demand. So remote stations, meaning pulling that, that switching of setback to isolation, pulling it over to where their actual desk space is, can be extremely beneficial to the hospital staff. You can save them a trip down the hall and any time we can save this staff some time is a win for the hospital staff. So we often call these nurses stations or remote stations. You can see an example of that in the bottom left hand side of the screen. These can be set up to monitor one room, two rooms, all the way up to eight or more rooms depending on the configuration and size of the device. Remote stations, however, can be a huge value add and we're going to come back to these again near the end of the presentation when we make some recommendations on the healthcare application. The next type of space we want to talk about are operating rooms. Operating rooms are a bit different than isolation rooms. In the end, the intent for these spaces is very similar. However, quite obviously, the usage of this space is completely different. Operating rooms vary more in their usage than they do in their application for valves and controls. Let's look at these rooms. Everybody knows what an operating room is used for. It's used to perform operations and surgeries. But there are different types of operating spaces. There are your general surgery spaces. These will be the most common you see in most hospitals and most clinics. There are emergency and trauma rooms. Those are essentially the same as general surgery spaces, but they run different hours. These are likely 24 hour a day, seven days a week type spaces. They can never turn off or set back. They need to be ready to go as soon as possible when a patient comes in with an emergency. And there are other things like endoscopy and hybrid operating rooms. All of these different types have the same intent, but their size and application and usage will be a little bit different. In an operating room, we need to take a step back and look at what is actually protecting the patients in this space. The same can be said for isolation rooms, but I like to touch on it more for operating rooms. You can see in this image what we would call a laminar array. The primary form of containment in an operating room is that laminar array. The person laying on that bench having surgery performed upon them is in an extremely compromised state. They have a wound that's been opened up. They have a, a surgical opening that's been made. They are very, very compromised. So what we do here is flow a huge amount of fresh, clean, 
slow moving air and wash it over their body. We then take it and pull it away into sidewall, corner mounted, low wall returns and make that nice airflow pattern you see in the image in front of you. The secondary form of containment is room pressurization and that's what we're going to talk about today. Positive room pressurization, we'll come to, back to this a little bit more as well, but positive room pressurization ensures that nothing from the outside world can gain access to that room, meaning very little from the outside world will get in, and then we get that primary form of containment from the laminar array, from that big slug of air washing over the patient. It doesn't have to protect the patient from much because the positive pressurization for the room has kept nearly everything out of that room. So knowing this, what you see in front of you now is a very typical operating room. Sometimes you might have imaging equipment in this space for a hybrid operating room that will cause it to get much larger. You'll also have to consider that in your ceiling array. You might have multiple doors to deal with, one serving a common corridor, one serving a surgical corridor. But overall, this is generally speaking what an operating room will look like. Look like. So what does ASHRAE 170 tell us about the operating theater, the operating space? First and foremost, these are positively pressurized rooms, positive 0.01 inches at a minimum. Most commonly, we'll see these controlled between 0.02 and even 0.05 inches, some threshold above that minimum, so that if there is any fluctuation in pressurization, we're still above that 0.01 minimum. I would say 0.03 inches is the most common one we actually see. That is the minimum according to the CSA standards as well, just for reference. When you look at ASHRAE 170, it doesn't technically and specifically say you require a permanently installed pressure monitoring device. It's a little bit odd. However, there is a note that states if you have pressure monitoring devices, allowances must be made to prevent nuisance alarms. So it's fairly implied that we do use pressure monitoring devices in these spaces. We need to maintain a pressure of, of a certain minimum and we need to avoid nuisance alarms. It's basically common sense now to always put a pressure monitor in an operating room. Just for reference, I've personally never seen an operating room applied without some sort of room pressure monitoring device. ASHRAE 170 also states we have a 20 air change minimum. This is well above that 12 air change minimum we saw in the isolation space. This starts to get to be a very, very high number. Um, when you get above 20, when you start hitting 25 and 30 air changes, temperature control is gonna be something we need to consider more, more than in the isolation space. We'll come back to that, however. The next point here is very, very important. Because our air change minimum is 20 air changes, and most spaces, let's, let's be honest, are operating around 25 or 30 air changes, we can make provisions to reduce that air change when the room is not in use. There can be a huge energy savings in reducing 20 or 25 air changes down to six or 10 air changes in unoccupied modes. So let's now look at some of the challenges that are presented by these spaces. These are very large rooms requiring a high air change rate. There will be a large volume of air. We have more equipment being installed that has higher cooling loads, meaning hybrid operating rooms with all of this imaging equipment will mean that thermal demand is something you need to consider more and more and more. And hybrid operating rooms are becoming more and more common. Operating rooms also have a very high in and out occupant traffic. Surgical staff, orderlies, things like this are going to pass in and out of the room, getting supplies, things like that, all throughout a surgery, meaning the doors to these spaces are constantly opening and closing. We also have many more surgical teams wanting more and more data available inside the room. They may want to see temperature, pressure, humidity, and air change rate all displayed inside the room, as well as being monitored outside the room. And one of the most challenging is the demand for tight but quick changes between setback and occupied modes. Meaning when somebody is being rushed into an operating room, in the matter of a couple of minutes, we need to get back up to 20 air changes or more, and we need to get our temperature control back in, in uh, 
in specification. So how do we answer some of the problems and some of the issues we've presented here? Again, and you'll see this as a theme throughout the healthcare environment, we recommend high accuracy terminals in the operating room environment. I would say this is more important here even than it is in the isolation space. And the reason I say that is a typical high accuracy terminal, like the one you see on the screen here, are capable of turndowns of 10 to 1. Your average VAV box is likely capable of a 3 to 1 turndown or even up to a 5 to 1 turndown, depending on the controls and transducers and equipment. Going from 20 plus air changes down to 6 air changes will become an actual controls issue if that turndown at the valve level isn't available. We've seen a lot of applications where VAV boxes are applied and they'll go from 25 air changes down to 6 or 10 and it's really just not accurately controllable down at those lower flows just due to the larger box size required to hit that 20 plus air changes. This is where the high accuracy terminal has a huge benefit with its 10 to 1 turndown ratio. We also recommend in these spaces that you also apply room pressure monitors across each doorway. If you have multiple doors, you may want to measure pressure into each of those other spaces. In the operating room, we also recommend volumetric offset. In this space, I do not recommend pressure control. Like we said, this recommendation comes from the very high in and out occupant traffic. In a pressure controlled environment where we use that room pressure as our controlled variable, our doors will cause us huge concern. When you open up a single man door or even the large sliding doors in an operating room, room pressurization will be lost momentarily. Pressure control has two options here. Its first option is to try to control room pressure with an open doorway. This will put an extreme strain on your mechanical system, and I would hazard to say that your mechanical system likely actually can't keep up with this. You will very likely not be able to maintain pressure across that open doorway. Your second option for pressure control is to freeze in place. It's to do nothing at all. Meaning, before that door opened, the room pressure was in control. The air valves and control system were all sitting in the right place to properly control that room. When the door opens, we will lose pressure. But when the door closes again, we likely want the air valves right back where they were before the door opened. So if we tell the control system to freeze when the door opens, we'll maintain better, quicker control of that space. Now because of the high in and out occupant traffic, the constant freezing of that pressure control loop will essentially turn it into volumetric offset control anyways which is a little bit easier to set up and to maintain. That's where our recommendation for volumetric offset comes from. We've got a few more recommendations here in the operating room environment as well. We also recommend local display stations inside the room. So the image you can see on the left is very similar to the remote nurses station we talked about before. However, this time it's set up for inside the operating room. This tells the surgical staff the status of the room, meaning are there alarms present or not? Are we in occupied mode or setback? What's the room pressure? What's the humidity and what's the temperature? And it may afford them some control over room temperature as well, if you'd like to provide that. Further to that, we also recommend you limit the available temperature set points to ensure you have very tight control. Again, you have a large volume of air falling slowly from your laminar array. For the surgical staff, even though draft rate is less of a concern for them, it is still a concern. We can't have large changes in temperature coming and washing over the back of their necks. We also want to maintain tight control of that temperature. With such a high air change rate, meaning 20 to 30 air changes, so every two to, uh, one to two to three minutes air is changing out in this space, Tight control would be more and more difficult just due to that volume of air. It's easier to control temperature control loops, it's easier to tune them to smaller ranges. Meaning if you're always going to target 65 degrees, you can get extremely tight temperature control. If you'd like temperature control that's very tight between 60 and 70 degrees, 
you'll have to spend much more time in the startup and commissioning of these spaces. While doing this, and this is one of the main challenges in an operating room, we also need to ensure those temperature control loops and capacities are capable of rapid room turnover, meaning going from one surgery to the next, we might make, need to make a several degree temperature change for a different surgical team in a matter of minutes. The same would go for warm-ups in the morning, going from that six air changes to 20. We may need to do that very quickly. This can be a serious challenge in the control of these temperature loops. It is very achievable, but it will take time in commissioning and startup. The third application we'd like to present is the compounding pharmacy. We won't be able today to get it very far into the compounding pharmacy application. Antec Controls has a past webinar available at antechcontrols.com, freely available for another PDH credit that digs deeply into this application. If you'd like to view that again, it's available at antechcontrols.com. But we'd like to touch on this a little bit today because the compounding pharmacy is an important part of the healthcare application. Compounding pharmacies are not what you would find in a typical grocery store or a corner store. What we're talking about here are rooms that are mixing up compounding sterile preparations. These are drugs that are not commercially available in the strengths and volumes that we need them. Sometimes we call these chemotherapy pharmacies or chemo, chemo drugs. That's the most common one you'll see mixed up in these spaces. Compounding pharmacies specifically are doing sterile or non-sterile compounding. They're mixing hazardous and or non-hazardous drugs and they contain buffer rooms and anti-rooms. Now the combination of these six is what makes these compounding pharmacies difficult to design. For the record, a hazardous drug sterile mixing space is the most complex space to design in 2019. This is the most difficult space you will have to work with above laboratories, above isolation rooms, and above operating rooms. That room is the most difficult. Each of these spaces has different requirements, however, and each one is designed to mix up different types of drugs. The standards we're going to reference here are the USP standards. You can look at ASHRAE 170, however, it mostly will point you to these USP standards for the better requirements for these spaces. So we're going to look at USP 795, 797, and USP 800. USP 795 covers non-sterile drugs. USP 797 covers sterile drugs. Sterile drugs are those that need to be protected from microorganisms. Most hazardous drugs mixing spa spaces for the record are sterile mixing spaces as well. USP 800 will cover all hazardous drugs. Hazardous drugs are those that are known to hurt the human genome, to be toxic to humans. Meaning, hazardous drugs for the person that needs the drug have a net benefit. Take chemotherapy, for example. There is a net benefit to the patient that receives chemotherapy. We can prove that. However, we also know there are a huge amount of side effects that are negative for that patient. Take a step back and look at the person mixing up that drug. The person mixing that drug up doesn't need the positive benefits from this drug. They will only experience the negative half of this. USP 800 expands the control for the protection of those workers and the environment around them against these hazardous drugs. USP 800 is intended to protect those workers. USP 800 was updated because there were notes of personnel uh, seeing adverse effects due to the exposure to this hazardous drug. That's why USP 800 was developed. Now in our pharmacy's presentation from earlier this year, this statement on this slide was a little bit different. USP 800 and USP 797 were going to be harmonized uh, later this year, as of December 1st. However, harmonization will be postponed because USP 797 and USP 795 have too many issues that have come up that need to be reviewed before their publication. So let's look at the actual engineering requirements for these spaces. In all of these spaces, a containment primary engineering control also known as a CPEC, must be located in a room that will function as a secondary engineering control, called a CSEC. 
That secondary engineering control, that room, must have an ISO class 7 rating. The CPEC, the primary engineering control, needs an ISO class 5 rating inside that piece of equipment. Generally, we're looking at biological safety cabinets in these spaces. When you're looking at a hazardous drugs mixing space, the most common we're seeing are the type A2, class 2, and type B2, class 2. Biological safety cabinets are split up into class 1, class 2, and class 3. As you go from 1 to 3, containment improves. However, soda cost and soda operating costs uh, increase as you go up to class 3. The most common, again, is the class 2 type. Type 2 is, or class 2, sorry, is split between the A types and B types, A1, A2, B1, and B2. For more information on the difference between those, again, please reference that past webinar. The minimum pressures we have to hit in these spaces are positive for the anti-rooms and positive, positive for the non-hazardous drugs mixing space. The hazardous drugs mixing space, that first pressure statement right there, is the actual problem we have today. And I'll address this more in a moment. But this pressure is no longer just a minimum. This pressure is a range. If you think back to the operating room and isolation room, what we presented were room pressure minimums. And we recommended, instead of targeting positive 0.01 in an operating room, you target some value higher to ensure that any variation still keeps you above your minimum. That challenge is amplified here in a hazardous drugs room because we have to go from minus 0.01 to minus 0.03 inches of water in that hazardous room. That is the biggest problem we have today in the compounding pharmacy. And when I say we, I mean commissioning staff, manufacturers, design engineers. This is a common issue in a compounding pharmacy. So let's look at that a little bit more. Let's look at more of the challenges presented. Number one, these rooms will require changes to existing facility layouts. To update to USP 797 and USP 800, you will likely have to change the form and shape of these spaces. You may need more space, which can be difficult to come by. We've now had to separate hazardous drugs and non-hazardous drugs. Compounding, which again can lead to the usage of more space. We need to do more frequent monitoring to tighter pressure requirements, which is much more difficult. And these rooms have an extreme air change rate. I didn't present it on the last slide, but in non-sterile compounding, you need 12 air ch changes per hour. In sterile compounding, so again, in most hazardous drugs rooms, you need a minimum of 30 air changes per hour. We're seeing this very commonly driven much, much higher even than 30 air changes per hour. If you have several biological safety cabinets, meaning if you have two, three, or four biological safety cabinets in a very small space, your air change rate can be driven up to 60, 70, or even 80 air changes per hour. We call these extreme air change rates. You're going to have very limited space in that room, meaning your biological safety cabinets and your storage will take up a lot of the footprint of that space, which leads to very, very limited ceiling space as well. The last two, however, are the largest challenge presented with a compounding pharmacy. Tight construction and room pressure requirements prescribed as a range. Compounding pharmacies are being built tighter than any other room we've spoken about today. Isolation rooms are generally fairly well built. Same with operating rooms. They're generally fairly well built and fairly tight. However, for reference, in those two types of spaces, the offset between supply air and exhaust air is usually about 10 to 20%. Meaning, 1,000 CFM of supply would require a 100 CFM offset typically all the way up to about 200 CFM. Sometimes we estimate 100 to 150 CFM per door. Compounding pharmacies are being built much, much, much tighter than those spaces. We're seeing compounding pharmacies that are properly pressurized between two and 5% offset. Precision airflow control valves are only that accurate. They're only accurate to plus or minus 5%. We're going to come back to that. Room pressure requirements, again, prescribed as a range, is a huge issue when you compound it 
with everything above. When you have tight construction, you have extreme air change rates, and you have to monitor that room extremely often, hitting that really tight range of minus 0.01 to minus 0.03 can be extremely difficult. You're essentially tied into targeting minus 0.02 as a happy medium, which gives you 0.01 inches on either side as buffer, which is not a large pressure in a small space. So rather than just presenting problems, we'd like to present some solutions you can look at to help solve these spaces. We recommend room pressure monitoring and display at each doorway. Again, we'll look at this a little bit later when we talk about recommendations, but we, sh we should be putting a display and a sensor at each threshold. You can see the small green lit up sensor at each doorway there. This ensures that when you walk into the ante room, you know it's safe. Then when you walk into either side, the left or the right, into either buffer room, you can see again that that room is properly operating and safe. This is a big one, the next one. We also recommend rooms be controlled as constant volume. Your hazardous drugs mixing space will be difficult enough to commission as a constant volume. Introducing variable volumes to this for setback modes or for temperature controls will add a huge layer of complexity and may possibly make this room never work and be in pressure control. So always control these as constant volume systems. Further to that, you should be isolating these compounding pharmacies where possible. We understand that this won't always be possible. They may be manifolded in with other parts of the hospital or clinic. But if you have the option and if you have the funding to do it, isolating your supply and exhaust air systems and controlling them as constant volume for this compounding pharmacy will go a long way to improving the commissioning and startup process and will go a long way to ensuring the longevity of this space and ensuring it stays in control. Further to all of this, we have a few more recommendations. Like the operating room, we would recommend volumetric offset for these spaces. Pressure control in a very small room with a very high air change rate with very tight construction can be extremely hard. Tiny minor fluctuations in airflow, meaning any small little tweak a pressure control strategy will make will have a huge effect on room pressure because of that really tight balance we have to make. In a more ideal world where we control using offset control or volumetric offset, we would set up to a certain set CFM offset and never move this system. There'll be very stable environments with that constant volume control and with a constant offset landing us at that proper pressure, we can ensure again the longevity of this space. In the compounding pharmacy, we would recommend either air valve technology. Both mechanically pressure independent venturi valves like you see on the right and high accuracy terminals like you see on the middle of the screen are useful in this application. Again, both are very good at this stable airflow control, at constant volume control. I might lean closer to the Venturi valve as the more acceptable solution. However, both are very applicable and we've seen both very well applied. The last one I want to make here before moving on is to ensure your reference spaces remain in control. So when you look at the image on the left, I'm specifically referencing the corridor. In a perfect world, that corridor is completely neutral or has perfect pressure control, meaning if we're going to pressurize that corridor to a negative pressure, for example, ensure it stays extremely stable. And I say that because the other room pressures are dependent on it. We're going to come back to this again just to land the point again a little bit later, but we call this a cascade. So if you look on the left-hand side at the hazardous drugs buffer room, its pressure is measured from the ante room. The ante room has its pressure measured from the corridor. So if your corridor pressure fluctuates and changes, it will look like your ante room and hazardous drugs mixing room both have fluctuating pressures. This can make it very, very hard to diagnose problems and can make the commissioning prog process extremely difficult. So where possible, ensure that reference space remains in control and as neutral as possible. 
Before we get into the healthcare recommendations, the last thing we want to talk about are fan filter units very, very briefly. Where you don't have the pressure from the roof, uh, rooftop equipment to provide the ISO class 7 classification, where you can't get that HEPA filtration in, you just don't have the pressure drop, fan filters are a very good solution to answer this. They provide that little boost you need to overcome the filter. One thing you can consider, and a newer product on the market, is a fan filter unit that has integrated high quality LED lighting. Remember, these are very small spaces. A compounding pharmacy is essentially a closet. The ceiling space is limited. Getting in your HEPA filter, filter diffusers and your lights can be difficult. Integrating those into one unit can have a huge benefit on the layout of that space. Now, some healthcare recommendations. Just in general, for all of these spaces, what can we do to make them easier to design? What air valve technology should we use? What speed of response is needed? How do we deal with pressure cascades? How do we ensure desired turndowns are achievable? And how do we consider maintenance and location in all monitor selections? So let's look at air valve technologies. In most applications in healthcare, we recommend high accuracy terminals on both supply and exhaust. They have a huge turndown ratio at 10 to one. That will help you achieve that 20 plus air changes turning down to six air changes in an operating room. They're also extremely accurate. They're good to plus or minus 5% of current airflow. Normal VAV boxes typically can't do that. They can at single constant volume flows, but they often can't do it across a whole range of flows. High accuracy terminals are also a little bit more resistant to contamination as compared to their VAV box counterparts meaning we won't have to clean them as often, and they'll deal with all that lint and linen in the airstream that we see in so many hospitals. VAV boxes may be acceptable in the right application. Again, their lower turndown rates may limit unoccupied modes, and they're not as accurate as high accuracy terminals and venturi valves. However, in constant volume applications, they can be well balanced and can be applicable. They also have a low resistance to contamination. The image on the right is a render, but I'm sure all of you have seen something similar to this, where you have lint and dust built up on one of those sensors, making it not very easy to control. These do need to be cleaned and maintained. They may only be suitable on supply in a lot of these applications. Last, but very much not least, is the Venturi valve. Venturi valves are an acceptable solution for every one of the three applications we presented. Venturi valves work extremely well, actually, in all three of these applications. They have a huge turndown ratio, up to 20 to 1 on some sizes. They're extremely accurate, plus or minus 5%. They are truly impervious to contamination, meaning on the exhaust or return side, Venturi valves will work as long as they have the pressure drop required across the valve. The reason we don't use them as our first recommendation in healthcare is that the pressure drop across them is a bit higher than VAV boxes and high accuracy terminals, and they are a bit louder than those other devices. Venturi valves are loud, particularly in the fifth octave band, or I should say louder in the fifth octave band, meaning we'll need to consider sound and sound attenuators when working with these devices to ensure in an operating room, for example, everybody is still able to easily communicate and doesn't have to deal with air noise in these spaces. The next thing we want to talk about is speed of response. Generally, in healthcare applications, we do not need quick acting actuators. A standard actuator, a standard speed actuator has a 90 second stroke time, meaning in under two minutes, you can go from full open to full closed. You can get from six air changes to 20 in about a minute. That's an extremely quick turnover for an operating room. We talked about compounding pharmacies. They're essentially constant volume spaces. They don't need quick acting actuators to deal with that constant volume. Quick acting actuators are generally reserved for laboratory environments. It's possible most manufacturers can put high speed actuators on their controllers and control them effectively in the healthcare environment. However, it's just not a cost or complexity you need to introduce to these spaces. And anytime you introduce speed, anytime you go faster in any control loop, 
you introduce that possibility for instability. Meaning, the quicker you move, the harder your control will be. How do we deal with pressure cascades? We presented this in the compounding pharmacy, but I'm showing images here of isolation rooms. Where possible, use common reference points. So you see the opposite of that here. If you look at the image on the right, you look at that combination AII and PE room, each room references the next. So the uh, buffer room references the ante room and the ante room references the corridor. Meaning if an issue exists in the corridor, you'll see it in the ante room and the buffer room. Where possible, if both spaces could reference the corridor, it would be much easier to diagnose any issues you might be seeing. You'll know better which mechanical system might be failing you, whether it's the buffer room or the ante room. Where you do need to have cascades, compounding pharmacies are one application where you probably need to have a cascade that we showed you earlier. Ensure your facilities team understands that, that when you see an issue in one room, it may be related to another room due to how pressure is actually being measured. The last thing here before we open the floor up to any questions is consider maintenance and location and monitor selection. This is thinking all the way down the line to the facility staff, the people that need to monitor and maintain this equipment and the people that need to use it day in and day out. When you're looking at pressure sensors, number one, they don't get cleaned very often. So explore strategies that are maintenance free. Some pressure monitors are available that require no maintenance cycle whatsoever. That can save time every single month. There is a savings with that year over year over year. Also consider how and where you're displaying information. You can see two different images here. On the left are remote monitoring stations. On the right are room pressure monitors. For the remote station, we presented this earlier. Remember that you can put these in, in remote areas at nurses' stations to show multiple rooms at once. So the nursing staff doesn't need to get up and go to the space to see how it's operating or change it over. They can do it right from their desk area. On the right are room pressure monitors. Most room pressure monitors are capable of displaying and measuring for multiple rooms at once. So first things first, there can be a cost savings here. A single pressure monitor, look at the image right in the center there, can display up to three rooms. It can take in three room pressure sensors and display it on a single monitor, cutting some cost out. But also consider that your nursing staff and facility staff are responsible for monitoring these devices. Wherever they want to see the display, is where they should get that display. If they want the display at every single, single threshold and doorway, that's where we should put it. Sometimes the cost here really doesn't matter. It's what's gonna make that day in and day out job a little bit easier for that staff. All of those options exist with modern monitors today. With that, I'd like to thank you all very much for your time and attention. If you have questions after the fact, you can please, you can reach out to applications at antechcontrols.com. Thank you.